looks very clear today for some reason. I need some water. Recording in progress. Why? Why? Uh, uh, how are you, Uma Devi? By your grace, I am fine, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> how are you, Maharaj? I'm doing okay today. You look good, Maharaj. Good. Do you have time for any other service? What are you doing? What service are you doing now? I'm nothing doing any service, mothers. <laughs> You're not doing any service. <laughs> Only attending the Sangha is not serve, doing any service. I'm attending the Sangha and chanting. And uh, that's only I'm doing. Mother. Okay. One, one minute. What's happening there? Anything? Any news? Ah. We are Maras? Yes, any Tanavats uh Deva who did it? Yes. Any news there in London? Uh no, I don't know anything, Maras. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> How are you doing, Deva Huti Didi? Good? Good morning. Thank okay. you. Is the virus still still diff difficult situation there? In my store, it is uh, fine. Everything is open, like uh, schools, uh -huh. college. Uh, okay, good. And uh, back to normal now. Yes, here in America, 2,000 people still are dying at every day. So, yeah, it's still difficult here. Hare Krishna, Nalini Tidi. Hare Krishna. How are you? Hi, we're okay. Everything good there? Yeah. Yes. Who is that? Who is that with you? Ah, uh, Rasheshwari. Rasheshwari. Yes. Yes, Rashi. Ah, Dandavat. Dandavat. Please, Maharaj, accept my Dandavat, Maharaj. My Dandavat to you, Mataji. Very nice. Yes, Hare Krishna. Rashi. You are from there, from that same place, Rashi Sri did. You are yes, from there. Are yes, I live here. You live in there, okay. <laughs> Are you living here okay. right now? <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> then I heard that Jadukho Paul got, oh, there he is. You are there. <laughs> you Dandavat know. Maharaj. Dandavat Pranam. Dandavat Maharaj. Dandavat Shama. Nice Shama to see you. Yes, you Dandavad. also. Dandavat. How are you feeling, Maharaj? I'm good, Prabhu. I'm very nice. And... I talked to Shanta Maharaj, and he told me he got the Gisa okay for you, huh? Yes, yes, he got in contact with the consulate. Right. Then they allowed the visa. Okay. So everything is all ready for you to go then, huh? Yes, we just need to take the visa in the consulate. They said that it will be ready Monday. All right, very nice. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> You can go to India now. Yes. Amazing. Because I think it's difficult getting visas to travel now with all this virus. So now you have to be very careful when you're traveling. Uh, put a mask. You have the vaccine, right, already? Yes, Maharaj, two doses. Okay. Me and Shemagori also. Okay. 
even sometimes that doesn't help, it says, <laughs> so, anyhow. So Krishna has to be there, has to give you his help also. <laughs> Shamagori is saying that she miss you, Maharaj, this week. She what? She miss me? you. Meets me. Needs me. Yes. Miss. Oh, miss, miss me. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes, Maharaj. In fact, uh, the whole week I'll be waiting for this class. You wait for this. Very good. I'll be waiting for your class. If you can plan one more day. Uh, I have plenty of questions. <laughs> A lot of questions. What question do you have, any now? Now, Maharaj? Yes. What is the most burning question you have now? <laughs> that the soul and consciousness, how they are interrelated, and uh, so many things. I think uh, all those will deviate from the class, I think. Hmm. That's a difficult question, actually. Not many, not many people understand these things. Yeah, actually, I was going through that. What is consciousness, and what are the different levels of consciousness from the scientific point of view, and how soul is related to consciousness? Every day, I'm getting a thought like, how uh, if the consciousness is related to soul, childrens. Uh, that they will not have consciousness, isn't it? That I am existing came to me somewhere around the fourth standard or something. That mm -hmm. awareness. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I am so late, uh, so dull -headed. Um, So that's what I thought. Consciousness, means the existence of mind will come to my mind. So is this consciousness uh, related to soul? Like all these sort of questions comes Maharaj to me. Yes. Consciousness and mind, not exactly the same thing, uh -huh. uh, because we can be conscious of what's in our mind. Mind is thinking, feeling, things like that, willing, and conscious. We can be conscious of that also. So we can't say mind and consciousness are the same. <clears throat> but anyhow, so far as soul is concerned, even the animal has soul, huh? right? Children, they have a soul. Animal has soul. So the soul is what we can call the sentient factor, sentient factor. Whatever has soul is also sentient. Now sentient means consciousness, but in a very primitive stage. Uh, sentient means if you can sense something, then there's consciousness there. The sense means to be aware that there's an object, there's something. Now at, at the level of the initial level of the soul and the, uh, the senses, and the, um, you can say the world, the material world of the world, whether it's material or whatever it is, when, this, when the animal is sentient or senses the world, it doesn't really make any distinction between itself and what it's sensing. Yeah, it's completely absorbed in what it's sensing as its own self. It doesn't make any distinction. 
what it senses is what it is. So that's why Prabhupada used to teach you're not your body. You have to start from there. That there's a difference between yourself and your body. But an animal doesn't see it like that. Or sometimes children don't see it like that either. That when you have a difference between the self, yourself, and your body or the object, when you have, when there's a difference. Oh, and there's a difference between Naman Hari Bol. That's uh, Sri Mati Devi, Hari Krishna, Hari Bol, and Hari Chyo Hari Bol. Hari Krishna. When when there's a difference, when we sense, when we know the difference, or we develop a sense of the difference between the body and the self, that's called consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Consciousness means that there's a subject object relationship. That may not be there at first for the lower level, the soul level. That difference may not be apparent. So it's only in the uh, human form that this difference and other animal forms sometimes that difference is there. Uh, so when we meditate upon that difference between us, consciousness and the object of consciousness, between the self and the object, that is the consciousness. And there, mind, mind is the, uh, the thinking faculty. Of how, how to, uh, necessary for the senses to make differences also. Sometimes we're sensing, the animals are sensing things. They're not, uh, there's no, How to say it? They don't. Uh, they don't really make any distinctions in the sense that, you know, if they eat something, they go for that, whatever it may be. They don't think this is a human being or this is a plant or this is an animal. They just eat it. They can distinguish between what is edible and what is not edible. Anyhow, it's hard to say because these things for the animal, what we what is conscious for us is unconscious for them. So they are not conscious. We make distinctions. That's the mind. The mind senses things, but it makes distinctions between things. Mind makes distinctions, either this or that. Animal makes distinctions, but is not does it doesn't do that consciously with awareness. Somehow does that we call it instinctive. Instinct. So for animals, what is instinct for us is a little bit more explicit. And that's mind. Mind is making the differences, the choices. In philosophy, mind is called determinant. It determines uh, different different things. If if you sometimes these optical illusions are very good to teach about the mind. Um, <clears throat> you look at a picture. You can see it in different ways. I don't know if you ever experienced that an optical illusion huh? you can the same picture you can see in different ways <laughs> and how is that possible <laughs> uh, same picture light is coming to you but you are interpreting in different ways some folks see the picture upside down some will see it this way some will see it that way some won't even see what the picture is showing other people can see what's in that picture and not other people can see Okay, like this picture. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. You've seen that picture? 
Yes, yes. Some people say it's a girl, a young girl, with a with a feather in her cap. Uh, other people will say, uh, "What is it? It's an old woman." Old woman, huh? Is that showing that? Yeah. Do you see the old woman? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> but I've seen this uh, long back. Uh, yes, sir. Let's see. I... The, the old woman is looking to the side this way with a long nose. She's looking down. Her mat, her mouth is down here. And then the young woman is looking behind her. She kind of has like a necklace on. Uh -huh. So I'm not able to see that. Not easy to see. No. I don't see it myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, there it is. There it is. Now I see it. I see it. I can see it. In, I can see it in the screen, but I can see it now. Yes. So something like that. You see. Some people can see it. Some people can't. But anyhow. They see different. Then what is making that difference? Why do we see it like that? One time this way, one time that way. That's the mind. The influence of the mind. Mind is necessary for the senses to perceive. If you if you look at that picture as a, just as a, some lines on a page, you can also see that. And you won't see any face. In order to see something, you have to know what it is you're trying to see. And that's the mind. Mind tells you. Uh, it's like this. It's an old girl. It's an old woman. It's a young girl. It's a face, even. Uh -huh. So without that discriminatory process working, the senses won't work. They won't tell you anything. And I like to give the example of the robot. When you make a robot, they put a tube. They call it a photoelectric tube. You heard of that? Photoelectric tube. You know what that is? No? Photoelectric tube is a tube that can pick up light from the environment. And that light will cause that photoelectric tube to emit energy, electrical energy. Uh -huh. Whenever that light comes from outside, hits the tube, the e energy will flow, the electricity will flow in that tube, and that energy can be put back into a computer. When that energy comes from that, uh, that wire from the connected to the tube, it will cause something to happen in the computer. So when you have a robot, you put a photoelectric tube and when, it's, when some light comes from some particular animal, the robot will send that signal to the computer and it will do something from the computer, another signal will be sent and the robot will have to move this way, that way, according to the light, or seeing the light. Okay. So the photoelectric tube is like your eye. Ah, the light comes. The eye sees that light, and then the electric current is sent to your brain, optical uh, part of the brain. They're, they're called a capital lobe. A capital lobe in the brain is where the seeing uh, electric impulses from the retina come uh, through the optic nerve to the occipital lobe. And then we see something. They don't know how it works exactly, but they trace that much that process. So same as the photoelectric tube then. No, similar, not same. <laughs> photoelectric tube gets some light, gets some signal, produces some signal, sends it to the computer, and the computer decides what to do, what that signal means. So the light, I receive some light, sends it to the occipital lobe, and the brain interprets what is that meaning, mis message, that's called mind, and the mind function. Consciousness is where awareness of that, what's going on, what the mind has decided.
So there's a difference. When we speak of consciousness, we have to speak of the difference between the subject and the object. Awareness. But another layer behind the consciousness is also there. And that's called the I, or the self, not the I, but the I, I self. Mm -hmm. huh? The self-consciousness. I mean self-consciousness. Beyond consciousness, there is consciousness of consciousness. That's called the I. <laughs> Hard to grasp, but the I is there also. Self-consciousness. He is integrating all the different thoughts, senses, mind, everything. He integrates it together into a one uh, into a unity of identity or identity of the self. All these different experiences we have, they are all related back to one thing which we call our self. All the experiences of life, all the experiences at any particular moment, they all have some kind of unity to them. That's our I, that is our self, our ego. So like that, there's the senses, there's the soul who identifies immediately with all those things. And there's the consciousness and the mind uh, and then the self-consciousness, the self, the I, all are there. Like the subtle body, subtle body is made up of mind, uh, intelligence, ego. So the subtle body is self, or is it something different from self? I can't understand. What did she say? Is the subtle body self or different from self? Ah, uh, so subtle body means the uh, mind and the booty, uh, booty and yes, booty or intelligence and ego. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That, that's Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> We're doing more analytic philosophy as far as psychology, you might say. So a little difference from Sankhya philosophy. In Sankhya philosophy, there's manas, buddhi, and ahankar as a subtle body. <clears throat> also, their own way of explaining it, how that relates to what I was saying is a little not so uh, easy to, to understand the, their, their relation. But um, uh, manas is mind in the sense of that which thinks, feels, and wills. And then booty, intelligence, that we may call reason. Like reason, you know? Reason is something that combines uh, things together to make sense of them to give a different, to give it interpretation. Manas means uh, in, in Sankhya, the whatever thoughts, whatever feelings, whatever will, desire we have, that is ma manas or Sankhya. But the integration of those things into some course of action or some uh, proper direction, you know, we can say like that. Like you may think something, I like to have some sweet, something sweet to eat. <clears throat> so your thought is there, then the desire is there also, I want to eat something sweet. And then uh, the willing will come from the desire and the feeling of enjoyment. All those things will be there at the manas level. Uh, if I have some sweet, as my first thought, then my feeling will be happy, I'll be satisfied. And I'm going to get that sweet and eat it and it's gonna taste so nice. All those things are the mind. But the intelligence comes in and says, wait a minute. <laughs> you eat that, you're going to get fat, you're gonna get your tooth problem. <laughs> so many things are gonna happen, something like that. 
and tries to organize the situation and to a particular what will the consequences be if then if that then this mind doesn't do that mind just gets what does for what it wants but the intelligence comes in and says if if i do this then this will have the consequences <clears throat> so intelligence is more synthetic synthetic uh, synthesis. Mind will say this or that, but the sense is said, if this, then that. And then the ego is the sense of identity with those things. With all those things, it thinks this is me. All these different uh, desires and thoughts and feelings that I have, that is me. And identifies directly with that. That's called ahankar. The false ego direct directly identifies itself with all those thoughts, feelings, and willing. Tony, can you mute your phone? Yeah, I can. I can hear you. Thank you. We can hear you also. Too many noises. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just uh, in a crowded room in the home. Uh, okay. uh, one second. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that Sankhya is another system of analyzing all those things that I'm talking about. I'm trying to present it in a different way, a more analytic way, a little different. Of what Sankhya is. Is, that, is that clear? So. Oh, <laughs> no more kitchen noises. Okay. So the yeah, similar but but a little different from Sankhya conception. Sankhya puts everything together in a more uh, synthetic way. I'm trying to take it apart in a more analytic way. And I present it in a more analytic way. So we have to make some distinction between what we find in the Sankhya and what I'm saying. But some similarities are there too. Uh, and not that there's anything different ultimately. And yeah, there's a deep subject. Yeah, uh, Prabhupada used to call consciousness the symptom of the soul. The symptom of the soul. So he distinguishes between consciousness and soul. A lot of devotees don't even know this. <laughs> they think consciousness is the soul. But a little study of what the philosophers have discovered about these things. And what the philosophers have said about these things. That knowledge is also there. If we want to study it, it's a little difficult, but you may be able to catch what they're saying also. Maharaj, may I have a question? Please. If, if the consciousness is a symptom of the soul, means also that the soul is more than consciousness. More than what? More than consciousness. So consciousness is a propriety of soul. Who? Is the soul more than consciousness? Oh. <laughs> So what is this more than consciousness? No, and not that is more than consciousness. You can say the soul is consciousness in a sleeping stage. Okay. Like, just like sleeping, you're aware of things. 
You know, when you're sleeping, you're aware of, but it doesn't, not fully aware. Is when you're awake. Huh? Oh. Yes, sun and sun rays. You can say the sun rays are hot, but they're not as hot as the sun. <laughs> when you say the sun is in my room, you mean the sun rays are in your room, but the whole sun globe is not in your room. <laughs> right? The sun globe is in your room, your room is finished. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, something like that but anyhow sun means soul means not there's awareness there but is not fully aware it doesn't make any distinction between itself and that which it's aware of that was the point I'm making in philosophy they call it immediate or unmediated unmediated or immediate there's nothing in between it, between the soul and what it's aware of. It just identifies directly with that, whatever it comes in touch with. But so consciousness, the consciousness yes? evaporates. The moment I become self-realized, uh, 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 the moment, uh, let us presume, that we get self-realized, Immediately, the level of consciousness, the difference between consciousness and self will go up, isn't it, Nara? When we become self realized, does the difference between self and consciousness dissolve? Ah. Well, one thing we have to recognize here that in the human form of life, okay, in the human form of life, Robert always said this human form of life, and Shinama is all tall. Human form of life is very valuable. Very valuable because uh, animal, they have consciousness, but they're not very highly developed. Uh, human form of life, we can create society, culture, religion, not that we create, but we can understand these things, philosophy, music. There's a higher level of development in the human form than in the animal form. However, there are some humans who don't develop any difference. They remain simply at the level of sleeping consciousness, almost soul, soul awareness. In other words, they are mid, uh, wholly involved and identified with the material atmosphere around them, with the world. They don't recognize the world as an object of consciousness. They think it's them. They don't distinguish. That's why Prabhupada said, you are not your body. You have to come to this real recognition of the difference between their self and the body between the consciousness and the thing, object of consciousness. Not that they're only different, but they are different. Mahabhavu taught a chintya beta beta tattva. So as we develop that difference, the sense of that difference, then we can think, we can make philosophy, who's who to, to people who are too much absorbed in the body, they are not very good philosophers or writers or this or that because it requires a little bit of understanding the difference. How important the mind is and things like that. When you're thinking, your, your body may not be doing anything except sitting there, uh, meditating and things like that. Something's going on, but it's not, the body is not moving. You're not accomplishing any work it seems yet there's something very important going on and where is that going on that is the mind the subtle world subtle plane and there we can find all these things about consciousness and so forth they will become more the distinctions that lie in that world will also become clear to us 
So in that sense, self-realization, uh, thus people who can understand the self beyond the eye, they can reach that platform. Now, beyond the eye, there's also something, all right? Otherwise, what are we talking about when we say Krishna? <laughs> More than just the eye involved. You say I, I say I, everybody here says I. How's that possible? <laughs> there are so many eyes. And that means there's some universal eye, not only our individual eye, there's also some universal eye. And we have to get beyond that immediate sense of I. It also is immediate and limited, finite. And that is the self, <clears throat> the self of all individual eyes. The real self is Krishna. Depending on how much we realize, maybe Paramatma, uh, maybe Vasudev, maybe Radha Krishna, and depending on how much we penetrate into that higher transcendental plane. Through surrender, that journey there won't be helpful. We won't be helpful for our analytic abilities to enter into. Analytic abilities will only deal with the outer portion, external portion of our inner world, the external differentiation that lies there. But the inner world, the higher inner world, will be guided by surrender to that, and giving up. Sri has always talked about die to live. We will have to forget that whole plane immediate eye and recognize there's something else that is controlling us and not only ourself. There's something more than what I am and that is not within my control. That is controlling me and to enter into that plane requires Sharanagati, surrender and service. Only thing that will help us there. And that will lead us to that higher world. The E Krishna. Mm -hmm. So the different levels, higher, higher, higher. And we can only get so far with our own effort. And then we have to call on something else, our faith <clears throat> and the guidance of those who have entered that higher plane. Mainly, it requires surrender to that higher plane and submission, humility, and earnest desire, that's all. And then they also have intelligence. They also have personality at that higher level. <clears throat> and they'll be able to find our way there. Evil. Hopefully. <laughs> By their grace. Okay, is it any clearer? It's not clear. Clear? <laughs> I, need, I need to go through your talk for a second. Then okay, I'm, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj. Yes. Yeah. Esses dias eu estava pensando em fazer uma pergunta que oportunadamente eu acho que dá continuidade ao que uhum. o senhor estava falando. É, eu estava é, querendo saber qual é a verdadeira forma de relação entre um guru e o seu discípulo. Como que isso deve acontecer de forma a que nós possamos realmente objetivar o caminho da rendição e da consciência? E eu gostaria de ouvir isso do senhor. Uhum. 
<coughs> Maharaj, I haven't been thinking on this question a few days already. I would like to know, Maharaj, about which the proper way that a disciple and the, and the guru can develop their own relationship so that the devotee began to develop, develop more saranagati, rendition, you know, and shraddha. How it works? Which the proper way? For the devotee and the guru? Yes, yes. Maharaj. <clears throat> Well, first of all, there's some spark that brings one, when one comes in the contact of guru, we know this is my guru. Some spark is there in the heart that we feel. Here we can find something that we are looking for. When I first came to Srila Prabhupada, um, I was, I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't even know I was looking for guru. <laughs> I didn't know you were supposed to look for guru. <laughs> but I came and Srila Prabhupada was there and my first feeling was that here is a person who is very convinced about what he is saying. <laughs> what he is saying. Here sounded so convinced to me, so perfectly and fully convinced of what he was saying. Uh, and I, I was totally unconvinced of anything that I understood. <laughs> In fact, that's why I was so confused because uh, I, uh, as a scientist, when I got my PhD, by the time I got my degree, I was thinking, we don't know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> uh, we developed this quantum theory. And um, one big uh, physicist, uh, mathematician, physicist, very well known in scientific circle. He told this uh, this one sentence that always just just uh, struck uh, like a struck my heart down like a lightning bolt. He said, uh, uh, "Something unknown is doing. We know not what. That is our theory of the electron." I don't understand that. They said, something un unknown is doing we know not what. Jai, Kanupriya Didi. Tandava pranams Maharaj, Tandavas devotees. Jai. Krishna Keshava Das Hare Krishna. Sorry, I'm a little late, Maharaj. It's okay. Tandavat pranam Didi. Tandava pranams. Hare Krishna. Good to see you. Lovely to see you. So he said, something unknown is doing we know not what. Now, as a scientist, I know exactly what he meant. Because electrons are something nobody has ever seen. And they can't see. They're too small. Weighs not, doesn't weigh very much. We can't see it at all. They say electron, but it's like they know what they're talking about, but nobody knows what it is. Nobody has ever seen one, and you can't see it. Do you know that? Do any of you know that? Probably you don't. The electron, nobody knows what it is. They have all these equations and everything and what it does, but what it is, they don't know. And they can't see it. Huh? Propagation cloud. Uh, propagation cloud. <laughs> uh, what are they called? Propaganda cloud. <laughs> it's a propaganda for the electron. Then we don't know what it is that's unknown. And then, uh, uh, or what it does. Uh, what did I say? Something unknown doing what we doing what? What is it doing? We don't know. And we can't know also. 
because we can't see the electron, we don't know what it's doing, and we can't know what it's doing, according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you try to measure an electron, the only, the smallest thing is the smallest particle. In order to measure the electron, you need the smallest particle, another electron. But as soon as you shoot another electron at an electron, of course, the electron is going to move, and you won't be able to tell what happened to it. They call Heisenberg uncertain. When you look at something, you disturb it, and then you can't understand where, where it is or what it was doing at that moment. Anyhow, the very technical things are involved there, but fundamentally it's true. What he said is true. Something unknown is doing, we know not what. That is what the whole theory of physics is based upon. It means Physics is based upon some kind of nonsense. <laughs> There's no basis. All our physics. Of course, they do so many things with it, but anyhow, really, it uh, has that kind of very uh, elusive basis. Elusive, like illusory basis. And when I heard that, I thought I became totally discouraged with science. I said, what are we doing? I spent all these years getting my PhD in physics. And this is the conclusion. <laughs> this is the conclusion we come to. And what's the word? A waste of time. Wastage of time. I thought, because I'm very idealistic. I like things to be properly explained and understood. And there was no such thing uh, in physics. Or the only proper understanding that thing we can come to is that it, we don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> so what can we say about the fact that it has such an illusory basis to the field and no concrete things to come out of it? I don't know. I think that's Krishna's mystical energy, Maya. But what else can I say? And difficult to understand all those things. My brain won't won't uh, calculate all those things, compute all those things. What's going on is too difficult. And anyhow, then I came to Srila Prabhupada and I thought, he's telling me with so much conviction that we are such Chitadanda, eternal, blissful, and full of knowledge. Uh, that was certainly not where I was at. <laughs> so, I thought, he is in that place. All right. I'm looking for that. <laughs> that sounds like a good goal. <laughs> How to reach that place. That place. Well, I thought, I'm a scientist. Let me try. Let me put myself in the test tube and see what he is, if I apply what he is saying, what he is doing, let me see what result will I get. That is the result that we can get, let me see. The result of physics was nothing. <laughs> uh, let me see what Prabhupada is teaching. What is that result? In the meantime, I was also interested in consciousness and all those things as a scientist for different reasons. And like that. So my understanding of the relationship that I had with Rila Prabhupada was that he was our guide, our guardian, our guardian. Many people say, I don't need guru. I can figure out these things myself. I can read books and, and think about all these things. And I could come to that higher conclusion myself. But I was thinking, here, this system is giving you a guide. In physics, we don't have any guide. We have to figure out everything ourselves. Oh, there's a teacher and all. But they don't tell you the final conclusion like that, or explain everything to us. We also have to apply it. But in Vedic system, there is guru. And guru means one who can guide you to the higher knowledge. And I thought, what a wonderful thing to have a guru, a guide. 
uh, you don't have to do it on your own. You have a guide. And the, and the, and the more you listen to your guide, the more you listen to your guru, the more you can understand that deeper, more personal things. So I was very happy that there was such a person in our lives, to have such a person uh, who can help us understand those things which are so far beyond us. When I was a young boy, I used to think about God all the time, but I had absolutely no idea what the heck I was thinking about. <laughs> what was that God? I knew it was there, he was there, or God was there, but what I was talking about, what, what to do, anything like that, we could go to the priests and they would say, well, you have to say Hail Mary and Our Father and so forth and so on, go to church every Sunday. But that wasn't enough. Like I had questions like you, Dave, who did, did he? Ah, what is the soul, what is consciousness, what is this, what is that? They had no answer. So that's the first thing. The guru is there, a wonderful system of guidance uh, and those deeper things, the most difficult things. And only we needed to have some trust in Guru Dave, some faith in Guru Dave, that he was very committed to what he was doing. And he had some, he could see something obviously that I was not able to see and understand and just trying to follow as closely as I can and faithfully as I can what his guidance was giving us. And we do that through his personal instruction to us and also through his books. And I was very fortunate to have a personal connection with Srila Prabhupada, talk to him personally, many, several times, not many times, several times. And he was uh, merciful enough to give me some direction as to what I should do with, with my life as far as service, serving him was concerned. About pre preaching in the scientific way to the scientists and so forth, about life comes from life. Uh, I had that much guidance in my life. Many, many people take up, take up guru but they don't really know what Guru Dave wants of them, what service. But Prabhupada made my service very clear. And I felt very fortunate in that because all life I've been just trying to fulfill that service request that he made to me. So that's important. If somehow we can catch that which Guru Dave wants us to do, what service he wants from us, that will help steady us in our course. But generally, of course, he wants us to remain faithful and try to follow that higher, the higher principles that he's giving us and make whatever progress we can. Ultimately, you have a relationship with Krishna and we want to try to cultivate and understand that uh, and develop our, that relationship. And in our line, the process is Radha Dasya, which means that we serve the Vaishnavas. We don't worry about those higher things. We serve the Vaishnavas and then those things will be revealed to us through the service of the Vaishnavas. Our highest spiritual achievement will be found in that approach by simply serving the devotees of the higher type, we will understand what our spiritual life, how to develop and what our spiritual life means and what our spiritual life is. I think the relationship between devotee and guru is based on those kinds of things. First, a very personal relationship and a, a relationship through the devotees and through service, through faith. And it's very, like I say, it's very personal, very personal. 
has to be, of course, affection there from both sides. We can't get much help if our Guru Dave doesn't like us. <laughs> so it has to be both sides. We have to try to do properly, nicely. Guru Dave, so Guru Dave doesn't get angry at us too many, too much. We like also Guru Dave gets angry. That's also very personal. <laughs> and helps us. And the real devotee doesn't mind being chastised by Gurudev. Some people, they get very angry oh, and they leave when Gurudev doesn't accept what they're doing. But that's only out of affection, trying to help us uh, progress in the proper line. And if we see it like that, then we can also make progress. And the examples that are given to us in these different bhajans that we sing, how much that relationship there is there between the devotees and Guru Dev. You can feel that in the words of the different songs that are sung by Gar Tam Das Thakur, by Srila Prabhupada. And that type of deep relationship they have. That can also inspire us to develop that type of feeling, that type of relationship. That type of love. One Goswami there are many Goswamis, but the family of Goswamis in Vrindavan, one Goswami said, the Krishna pray means love for the sake of love. Don't love for any reason other than love. Love has its own reason. Krishna praying means love of God, and love of God means love for the sake of love. That's absolute love. Love loves itself. Love is its own reward, something like that. To be able to learn how to love for its own sake, and not to look for some other result or for some other consequence. We are lovers, <laughs> lovers of God. And that means love for all. And when we, and love is the happiest thing, the most wonderful thing, of course. In this world, it has some other meanings, <laughs> tragic sometimes. But love is basically like that. Love is a very higher plane of awareness or existence. And once we have that love, we are also, not only are we happy, but everyone is happy. And we can spread that to others, infectious. I think that's the highest thing we want to aim for. Uh, <clears throat> That relationship between the devotee and guru is one of love, guru bhakti, and, and it's the cultivation and nourishment of love. And that type of relationship, once we reach that, that is the universal good. That is the thing we all aspire for.
that sweetness, that beauty that comes from the real love, uh, the higher, higher love, we can call it, transcendental love. And there we find everything. When that is pure, when love is not motivated by anything but love, then we get the purest and highest thing that's available for us. I want to call it a thing, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Wow, thank you for asking so many deep questions today. <laughs> I think you're sorry. I have no words, Maharaj, but it's all nectar, what you said. <laughs> are you two, are you talking from different places? Nalini Didi and Chadagopa? No, Maharaj, but few computers because too many people cannot fit in oh, one computer. Okay. <laughs> okay. They, you can see they are here. One moment. Look, they are here. Ah, uh, there you are. <laughs> Chai. Very nice. The same table. Same table. Okay. Very nice. So, Kanapriya Didi, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. Hare Krishna, Dhanavas Maharaj. Yes, I went on Harinam last Saturday. It was very nice. It was only a small group, but it was really lovely. Okay. We really had, it was very good. Yes. So, been okay? Yeah, been well. Yes. Busy. Busy with things. And yourself, how's your health, Maharaj? I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Yes. Getting there. Health is always a long uh, a process. Huh? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so one day you may say, yes, I'm healthy. Another day you may say, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a process. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So any news from there? What's happening? Things going on as usual? Business as usual? Yes, I think so, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No changes, huh? Have... No. Okay. Not much the same. Yes. Yes, I want uh, uh, Krishna Keshava to get in touch with you about that money money pro pro oh, yeah. process. How yeah. to how they are doing that, how they are conducting their business, their transfers, and then maybe uh -huh. we can also do this a similar thing from the Institute. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. That'd be nice. Okay, we'll find out, Maharaj. Let, let, us, uh, let Krishna Kesha will speak to you about that. Yes, okay. Yeah. All right, so, since we already had a long kata, maybe we should just begin with Vandana, or unless anyone has any other question, shall you make this a question and answer day? Maharaj, oh. é, uma pergunta, mais uma perguntinha. Nós aqui é, conversamos muito entre os devotos e às vezes existe uma vontade de, como nós estamos distante é, do guru, é, de conversar com o guru, de é, é, ligar para ele ou fazer alguma pergunta que para nós seria importante. Mas muitas vezes a gente imagina incomodar como que a gente pode conversar com o Guru, talvez com um problema que, que está, de repente, sendo pessoal para mim, 
e, e eu, eu necessitaria dessa orientação, mas eu vou incomodar meu guru? Isso é um pensamento correto? Ou, na verdade, a gente teria essa liberdade de poder fazer um contato com o nosso guru dele? Maharaj, many times I think that not only me, but also some devotees would like to ask something to the to the spiritual master, to the guru, but they are afraid that I do not I don't want to disturb my spiritual master. You know, I don't know his routine, what he's doing. I don't want to steal his time. So it's right to think on that way, Maharaj. How should we approach the spiritual master to ask this if we are far away, bodily far away? You know, different countries and etc. Well, it's useful to have the uh, a personal direct contact with Gurudev or with his representatives, the other Vaishnavas. <clears throat> Now, if we have those around us whom we trust and whom we love, then they can also help us huh? in our understanding of what is Guru's mission. And that's also very important. Sometimes I found that when there's too much focus on Gurudev, we neglect the other Vaishnavas around us. Or we think they're less. <clears throat> And that's not very nice. They, the devotees depend upon one another for their trust and for their love, for their service. And they are helping us and we are helping them mutually. So we must have a good relationship with our associates. If not, then we're in the wrong association, I feel. So always look for that. If you don't find that kind of association around you, then you can have a relationship with Guru through uh, calling, telephone, or uh, email, something like that. Or, you know, these group meetings with Guru Dev, uh, also helpful. If it's not too big, if there are too many, then it becomes a problem, I think. So, both ways I think is possible. I remember we used to write, used to write letters to Srila Prabhupada. He would always answer. A little help, that was a little helpful in that way. Of course, there was nothing like meeting him personally, having a personal relationship. But other devotees had so much faith, so much love for Srila Prabhupada, it didn't really matter the circumstances with Sir Henderson. They somehow or other knew and had a connection with Prabhupada wherever they were and in any situation they were, they were in. So I think these are spiritual matters and therefore they don't obey the ordinary laws, you could say, of relationship. You can have that kind of connection, transcendental connection. It is there under any circumstance. always desire to please Guru in our service. That should be our guiding principle. And if we don't have the direct connection, we can still keep that inner, within our heart, that, that type of connection. And I've seen many devotees have that, very sincere devotees. They have the desire to please Gurudev, and they're, sometimes they feel they're closer to Gurudev than anyone else. They're always very humble, properly 
doing proper Vaishnava etiquette, showing proper Vaishnava etiquette. And the only thing that they have is that desire to serve and please Guru Dave. And somehow that manifests in the desire to serve and please those who are around them. And they don't find any fault for those who are around them, even though there are maybe many difficulties. So if we can be in that position, we can have that circumstance in our heart that our and somehow or other we have come into touch with that idea, that concept, then I think we'll be okay. You will have that intimate relationship. Like I said, it's transcendental, so not to be judged in an external way by geographical considerations. <laughs> huh? Guru and Krishna, they're there, always guiding us. When Guru disappears, then what do we do, right? They might have a personal relationship, but when Guru disappears, then what? And where are, we, where are we going to get our guidance? <clears throat> so that requires a little, little bit of advancement, a little advancement as, and as devotees. Then we will understand how Gurudev is always present. Charya Mam Vijanayat. You'll understand from that level that Krishna is the Guru. Maharaj, is that you're explaining the outer guru and the inner guru? Is that what you're talking about there? The what? The, the inner guru or the outer guru. Okay. Yes. Outer guru is called Mahanta guru. Inner guru is called Chaita guru. And Sridhar Maharaj once explained that Chaita Guru means the impression that Guru Dev has left in you. What was that impression that he, that he impressed upon you? Those things that he impressed upon us. That is our Chaita Guru. That will be our guiding uh, forces what Gurudev, was this the nature of Gurudev? Was this what he was saying? Was this what he's wanting? Are others manifesting that same quality, same ideas? <clears throat> if they are, we want to associate with them. Or showing that same direction, same mood. Or giving us that same inspiration in our spiritual life. Sukriti is said that we have, if we have the Sukriti, we will meet proper guru. There's a qualification, the sukriti, the merit. Our hearts know what they are after. And if they are after the pure thing, they will come in contact with those who are giving that. And we will only will find satisfaction in that. We won't find it in other things. And like that, we have to go on. We're trusting our hearts that brought us to Guru Dev, that made us accept that Guru Dev as, as Guru Dev, and accept those things that come even after his disappearance, that f further cultivate that which we were looking for in the beginning. Not that we don't change our change, 
And there's definitely change comes in, in our spiritual life. And different things will guide us according to our development of our own inner consciousness. Different associates and so forth. Have you ever read that uh, Sanat so Nanta Goswami's Brihad Bhagavatam Ritaha. Have you ever read that? Brihad Bhagavatam Ritaha. No. In there? Yeah, the, what's his name? Gopa? Oh, Gopa Kumar, huh? In that book, Gopa Kumar is going through different levels of consciousness, subjective evolution of consciousness. And he meets one group of devotees and he's the, from um, some particular level. And then he has to leave them and go to another level. He meets another group. And in each level, there are different levels of devotees that are also connected with that level. And the same is true in the spiritual world. Those who are in the uh, Sakaras, those in the Vatsayaras, those in the Madhuyaras, are different different groups of devotees. They're not all the same. Even in the Madhuyaras, there are different groups. The Chandravali group, the Gopi Manjari group. Radharani's group and so forth. I don't know so much about that, but anyhow, we know from reading that there are different groups. Maharaj, can you write that? Is it possible to write the book oh, down sorry. in the chat? Oh, Krishna Keshava can write the name of the book in the chat. Brihad, nice. Brihad Bhagavatamrita okay. by Sanatan Goswami. Brihad Bhagavatamrita. Bhagavat Amrita, Bhagavat Amrita, the nectar of the Bhagavat, a brief, a brief exploration of the nectar of the Bhagavatam. He is actually following the Bhagavatam in a very brief way, explaining the different levels of devotees and moods that are found in the Bhagavatam. There's a development in the Bhagavatam according to the levels of the devotees, consciousness or awareness or devotion. <clears throat> the gopis have the highest, they're in the 10th canto. Starts with Parikshit Maharaj, who is about to die. So he's still in the bodily concept and trying to get out of that and go back and enter into the spiritual concept. And from there it goes up to the gopis. I'm surprised people don't, more people don't know about that. Brihad Bhagavatamrita, a nice book. I, I have read Maharaj a few years ago. We can, if you think that's a great, good idea, we can translate it to Portuguese. You think that's good? Why not? They're all good. <laughs> Sanat, <laughs> Sanat, Sanat Goswami's book is very valuable. Yes. Someone we will do that. Yes. Sanatan is one of the six Goswamis, important. And that is the book of uh, subjective evolution of consciousness. Mm, there it is laid out. What is the meaning of subjective evolution of consciousness at a certain level? 
<clears throat> and that is the book that Srila Siddharmar told to Prabhupada is the book on which the planetarium should be based. You remember? And Srila Prabhupada wanted to build that planetarium, Vedic planetarium. And that was inspired by Srila Siddhar Maharaj, who told Prabhupada that it would be nice <laughs> if they could build a visual image, uh, a visual diorama of this uh, Srimad Bhag Brihad Bhagavatamrita, that description of the gradations of development in spiritual consciousness and devotional life. It would be good if you can do that in a visual artistic form. Uh, and there, uh, from there, Prabhupada was, got that Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada, got that idea for building the Vedic planetarium. And now, of course, they're building that gigantic temple in Mayapur. And I heard that along the sides of that building, they're going to put the different stages on the Brihad Bhagavatamrita along the sides of the walls, the different dioramas explaining that, which is very nice. It would be very nice if they can do that. <clears throat> And <laughs> Krishna said, uh, Krishna, do you hear? Why don't you have you put on your microphone? And the, the service project that we're trying to very slowly do in Princeton uh, is also based off of that book and instruction from Srila Sridhar Maharaj. Shripad Pori Maharaj's idea uh, originally for the Vedic Planetarium, but we're trying to use it for this project uh, in Princeton, is to have the building be like the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, which is like it's a giant ramp that goes along the inside of the building because that kind of structure uh, complements a concept that's trying to be presented, like gradually developing to higher stage of consciousness, and then at the top is the highest stage of consciousness. So. But with, with the version that we're building, it's trying to uh, do it in a way that is with the scientific preaching. So it's a little bit more dynamic than just depicting exactly what Gopu Kumar experienced in Brihad Bhagavatamrita. It's trying to represent that progression. Not only uh, a visual, but also a kind of a philosophical understanding. What is the meaning of subjective evolution? Um, in a systematic way, that's where scientists, rational people, can also try to grasp the ideas. Nowadays, people are like that. They have a scientific, rational um, attitude. Well, we can serve that also. They can try to satisfy that. As best we can, if it is the Lord's will.
हरी कृष्णा महाप्रभु How much mercy Shri Lal Prabhupada and Shri Lal Shri Maharaj have given to the world to make all of us so eager to learn about these things. Huh? So many people of the modern world are concerned with so many other things, but a few very, very, very fortunate souls. They are looking for the transcendental understanding of the world, of life. Mahavadanaya, the great mercy of the Lord. Great mercy of the Lord has made you all indifferent to those things, more or less. <laughs> Endeavoring to those things and to search for the higher things. Members of that world, members of that soil, Shita Maharaj used to say, you are children of a different soil. <laughs> children of a different soil. That is the home that you are interested in. Not the home of this soil, the home of that soil. How to live there. Young or old, <clears throat> we're all looking for that. Amritasya Putra. They're all sons of nectar, sons and daughters of nectar. We are born in nectar and we are born to taste that nectar. And we won't be satisfied with anything but that. That is our nature. Constitutional nature. Amazing. Anything else? And <laughs> Shall we read Pandeham? Pandeham? Page 38. Pandeham. Pandeham, Shiguru, Shiguru, Parakamalam, Shiguru, Shiguru, Vaishnavam, Sha, Sri, Sri, Rupam, Sagrajatam, Sagana, Raghuna, Sangitam, Sam Sajiva, Sadvaitam, 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 Shri Radha, Radha Krishna, Krishna Padam, Sagana, Sagana Lalita, Shri Vishkan Vitaun Shah, Om Agena Tundrinhasya, Janajana Shalakaya, Takshum Militamena, Asmai Shri Gurve Namaha, 
Govinda <laughs> Devam <laughs> Shri Siddhanta Saraswati Ti Vidito Gauriya Guran Vaye Bato Vanariva Pavata Gagane Gura Sankirtanai Mayavada Timingo Lodada Gatan Udhati Jirani Man Krishna Prema Shabadi Gahan Sukham Prada Pubhum Tam Bhaji Namo Gorki Shoraya Bhatiya Vaduta Murtaye Prangi Pada Brangaya Pada Bhava Nishivini and they back even know Dam Shri, go to Shakti Shurupakam, Shakti Shastragi Samrajam, Rasa Sudanidim, go to Vajasita Sheshire, Vaishnavar Vandya Vigraham, Jaganata Prabhum Vande, Prim Veda Vaishnavam. Chakapa to Jescha, Kripasa to Vivacha, Patitana, Namaha, Chakapa to Shnam, Rupas, Rupakam, Matavatam, Yakyam, Mami Bhakti Shakti Kam, Namo Mahavadanaya, Krishna Prema Pradhaya. Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Nam Guru Gauda Jishe Namaha Jayatam Siddhartur Bangor Amanda Matirgati Sarvasva Padam Bhucho Ramadana Mohanu Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 
जय श्री गोपाल श्री गुरु महाराज श्री गुरुदेव श्री लक्ष्मी देव की जय जय गिरि गोवर्धन की जय जय प्रेम नंदी हरि हरि बोल हरि बोल जय समवेद वाक्य विन्द की जय जय समूह वोटिस और ग्लोरी टू द वर्ल्ड वाइड वोटिस को प्रेम नंदी परमहंस परिव्रज के चार वरिष्ठोत्र सात शिशमाच लबक माधव पूरी महाराज की जाए जाए श्री निष्काम संत महाराज की जाए जाए विज्ञान मुनि महाराज की जाए जाए श्यामगौरी ओम देवी जीवनामृत Page ninety-six. Okay. Page ninety-six, and text number eight. Page ninety-six, text number eight. <clears throat> Upalabhya Krishna, Shrayaika Mangalasya, Chasraya Prapti Vilambane Tad, Aprapti Sambhava Sambhava Nayam, Udvega Prakasha. Krishna, Tvadiya Pada Pankaja, Panjarantam. अध्यायमेंशुराजहंसाणपणायणपीठाधोस्मरणुशेखर से Hey, Bahuti Didi, can you read the English? Yes, ma'am. I'm reading ninety-six. Words number. You have it. Ninety-six. Words eight, isn't it? Ha. Kula Shaker. The expression of anguish in the suspense of delay in achieving the shelter of Lord Krishna by one who realizes that shelter to be the only good fortune. O oh Krishna, please allow my mind to immediately lead to your lotus flower-like feet. Just as the flamingo enters into the retreat of the lotus flower stem, when at the moment of my last breath, my throat becomes constricted by action of the bodily humor, air, mind, and strength. How will I be able to remember you, Shri Kadashekara? <coughs> So the first part, that is from Sri Dhar Maharaj, is giving an explanation of the verse that is found in the scripture. So each verse is accomplished by accompanied 
by a, a little uh, note, a little explanatory note by Srila Siddhar Maharaj. So the first line is a, the note uh, expression by Siddhar Maharaj, on sort of like a, a brief commentary on about, about the verse that is to follow, a concise summary of what the verse is about. So he's saying this verse is about the expression of anguish. When, when we have some, when there is some delay, when we experience some delay in trying to take shelter of Lord Krishna by one who knows that that shelter is the ultimate thing. What kind of feeling do they, they have is explained here very nicely by King Kulakshetra. And so he's praying, oh Krishna, please allow my mind <clears throat> to yield to your flower-like lotus feet. Just as the flamingo enters into the lotus flower stems. You know the flamingo? And the, the long, long legs, uh, you ever seen? Uh, for me, oh, they were pink. I think they have pink birds. They have long birds and then they have a long, long neck, long neck and a beak. And they go down into the water, <clears throat> into the lotus stems, plus the stems of the lotus flower. And they look <clears throat> in the roots of those stems for some nectar to eat. Some, the water produces some food for the flamingo. Huh? And they go into the lotus then to try to suck up that food into their beak. The swans also do that. You know? And I don't know about the flamingo, but I know the swans have these little teeth, very tiny teeth in their beak, very fine teeth. And they do that, they go into the lotus stem and they suck up the nectar and then they take that nectar with their water and they squirt out the water from their beak. Sometimes you might have seen this just go on. There's some water coming out from the mouth <clears throat> and all they're doing is spitting out, somehow spit out the water through their teeth and all the nectar remains within their mouth <laughs> and the water goes out and then they can swallow that nectar. So like that. So please allow my mind into your lotus-like feet uh, to go in there and to let to get all that nectar to come in touch with that nectar, that nourishment, just like the flamingo tries to get his nourishment. When at that moment on my last breath, when my throat becomes constricted. Huh? By air, bile, and phlegm. How will I be remembering? How will I be able to chant your name when I'm feeling like you're drowning in your own fluids? <clears throat> will I be able to keep my mind so fixed upon you that all these other things won't be a distraction? Don't be a distraction for me. And I can just remember, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And all other things will not bother me. That kind of focus, that kind of attention, I want to have that. Praying in that way. Unpointed. And you know that verse from the Bhagavad Gita, Yang Yam Vapi Swaram Bhavam Tajat Yante Kale Varam. Yam Yam Kaiti. I don't remember now the last line. Tajat Yante Kale Varam. And yeah, 
It means that whatever your mind is fixed on at the time of death, that's the life life you will accept in the next life. Whatever, what verse is that? Eight? Six. Eight? 8.6. 8.6, huh? <clears throat> whatever uh, you are fixed on, whatever your mind is fixed on at the time of death, that state you will stage, you will surely achieve in your next life. <clears throat> so this is what our yoga practice is about, fixing the mind. The devotees feel some anxiety when they can't do that, or in the process of doing that. Please let me do that. Please let that happen for me. Not so much that we want to go back to the next world, <clears throat> so that is our only happiness. We don't find any satisfaction in other things. We don't seek satisfaction in other things. Okay. Text night. Go to the next text. What, what um, text are you on, Maharaj? Because I'm on the online one. I have okay. It, I'm, I'm We're on online. page 96, text oh. 9. Page Thank 96, you. text 9. Uh, next, 9 is the next uh, verse underneath 8. <clears throat> on the same page. Hmm. You have it? Yes, Maharaj, I just trying to download it. Get here. It's, where's it gone? Here's 96. Yes, I have it, Maharaj. Thank you. So, Rupata Eva, Sri Krishna Sya, Bib, Bavad, Katva, Palakatva, Darshanena, Tadashraya, Partana. Krishna Rakshato, no Jagatraya Guru, Krishna Nandavam Sada, Krishna Krishna Nakila Satrubo, Vini Hatta, Krishnaya Tasma Namaha, Krishna Eva, Samutitam Jagat Idam, Krishna Sya Daso Smaham, Krishna Tishati Vishwamitad, Akilam K, He Krishna Rakshavam Ham. A prayer for the shelter of Lord Krishna. With the vision that he alone is the natural guardian, sustainer of the living being. Umadidi, would you like to read the English? You have, have the page? A prayer for the shelter of the Lord Krishna with the vision that he alone is the natural guardian and the sustainer of the living being. May Lord Krishna, the guru of the three words, protect us. Our ambition sent to Lord Krishna at all times. Krishna is the vanquisher of all enemies. I offer my obeisance into the, the Krishna. This word emanates from Krishna. I am the servant of only Krishna. This whole universe is situated within Krishna alone. Oh Krishna, please protect me. Sri Kulakshetra. Krishna is the guru. The vanquisher of all enemies, the source of everything, and the whole thing is situated in him.
in whom we live and move and have our being. Krishna, is that in whom we live and move and have our being? That is Krishna. The absolute truth. And whom we live and whom we move and in whom we have our own being. Without Krishna, we wouldn't be. Our own being, our own existence is dependent upon his being. I don't have my own being. No. Sunshine doesn't have its own separate being, right? The being of the sunshine comes from the being of the sun. Without the sun, the sun sunshine wouldn't be there wouldn't be. Being of the sunshine is depending upon the being of the sun. Sweetness of sugar. The sweetness of the sugar doesn't have its own being. Without the sugar, there would not be any sweetness. No? Some things have their being in other things than themselves. <laughs> they call it appearance. Appearances have their being in something that, that, from which they are appearing. All appearances. Appearance has its being not in itself, but in that which is causing it. <clears throat> so this world doesn't have its own being. The world is an appearance. It's what appears to us. We think that the world has its own being, but it is only an appearance. Just like sweetness is the appearance of sugar. The world or nature is the appearance of that which has a nature. It's actually the appearance of spirit. So we also soul, the uh, ent entity, living entity, this individual's uh, personality, whatever you want to call it, as it's being in Krishna. Uh, Mahaprabhu told, we are Jivara Swarupoy Krishna Nityara Krishna Das. Nityara Krishna Das. That is our being. That is our identity. Nityara Krishna Das. We are eternally servants of Krishna. And we have no other being beside that. Whatever other being we think we have, that is all Maya. That is illusion. That is a hankar. You have no other being except a servant of Krishna. And when we're not doing that, we're in Maya. are simply mayak energy, maya's energy, and all that we are thinking ourselves to be is maya's energy, illusory energy. We are living in illusion, an illusory life, an illusory identity. So we have to think how this is, how this is true. Huh? How can it be the proper? <laughs> things to meditate on. What is our real being? What is our illusory being? So prayers. Prayer to Lord, to Lord Krishna. You are the guru. You are the remover of all energies. You are the source of everything. And you are the place at which everything rests. Krishna says in the Gita, everything rests on me like pearls rest on a string. Huh? You know, when you wear a pearl necklace, what's holding them up? Pearls don't hold themselves up. <laughs> you say it's a pearl necklace, but really it's a string there that's holding them. And, and, and it's a necklace. That's the real thing. 
But we don't see the string. We only see the pearls. But that string, that's Krishna. What's holding everything up? What's holding everything together? And that's Krishna. Outer show, that's one thing. But the inner strand, that is Krishna. Whose world is it? Who's in charge? Who's who's it for? By his will, everything is happening. For his pleasure. Very nice. A nice prayer he's giving here. In Shakara. Or the more we meditate on this, the huh? more we can meditate on this, uh, this type of understanding of things, the inclusiveness, huh? inclusiveness of Krishna, how he is uh, representing all these things, how he is all these things, the more we can get shelter of him. When we recognize the totality and completeness of his uh, being, then the more we will, we will recognize how taking shelter of Krishna is the only thing we can do. Less we understand, the less we will be able to do that. We will think other things have some substantiality. That I can do this, I can do that. Rely on this, I can rely on that. But the more we understand that these are just the pearls, and the real thing holding them together is the strength. Uh, don't be in, uh, enamored by the pearls. Recognize the simple thing underneath them. <laughs> The whole thing rests on that. Jadu Krishna Prabhu, are you translating all of this as I'm speaking? Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> yeah. They are such a gift. The gift of Mahaprabhu. And you are always sitting behind the, 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 the scope of your screen. I can never see your face. But still you are there doing everything. <laughs> you can widen your screen. Widen your vision. That's better. Yeah. Now I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> you are there. It's like the string hiding behind the pearls. <laughs> Any comment? Any more ideas that you get from this? Inspiration that anyone has from this? Like us, right? We, you think that the uh, individual is just a body, but there's something else. They're holding the body together. 
You know, if you become unconscious, what happens? What happens to the body? It doesn't move. No, it doesn't move. It collapses like a whole, like a, like a brick building, collapsing upon itself. All the bones, everything, the muscles, they all lose their uh, tensile strength, and it just collapses on the ground, like a puddle. No, if you lose consciousness, body drops. We'll still breathe though. They're still breathing, but body, body is being body held, up held up by consciousness, consciousness. in defiance of gravity. gravity. It defies gravity and it's standing up. Why? What is that force that makes you stand up? It's the consciousness, <laughs> not the bones, not the muscles. Bones, the muscles are all there in that pile on the floor. Uh, not them. The thing that makes the whole bones and muscles get up is the consciousness. It's all resting on consciousness. When consciousness leaves the body at, at the end, it also becomes just a pile of bones and muscles. They don't move, they don't stand up. Uh, you know, on Halloween, on Halloween they show these skeletons, they're all standing up, that's not possible. Wasn't uh, what, um, what's his name? Um, the Demon King, uh, Robert? No, the other one, the father of uh, Harani Kashipu. Harani Kashipu, yeah. He was doing austerities until he was like, he was still conscious, but the, the bugs had eaten all the way down to like his skeleton, basically. So he was putting your theory to the test. <laughs> I was still conscious. Yeah, but he was super, like, empowered somehow. He was a devotee. The consciousness is very important. That's the thing that's giving the whole world its substance, its structure. It doesn't come from the world itself. It doesn't come from the body itself. That is a materialistic vision. They think the body is the doing everything. They explain everything in terms of the body, and they don't know that the mysterious force underlying it all is really what is doing everything and supporting everything and producing everything. Matter comes from life. What is the difference, uh, the real difference between individual and universal? If we say that all individual consciousness are like all the different human, uh, all the different living entities, and then the universal consciousness is God, Bhagavan, but Bhagavan himself is an is an individual, so the universal returns to the individual. So what is the real difference between the two? It says in the scripture that. Nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitananam eko pahunam yo vidratikamam. There are two the universal nityo, the universal in eternal, and the nityanam, the many eternal, the one eternal and the many eternals. Chaitanas chaitananam, the one conscious and the many consciousness. So they're one and many. Generally, we think these are totally different, but they are the same also. One and many is not different and also not different. 
Mahaprabhu taught this at Chinti Beda Beda Tatra. To understand how one and many are not different requires some thought, some different, some uh, uh, deep thought. That when we say many, what do we mean? We mean something that we don't uh, that we don't really understand what we're saying when we talk about many, because many mean many ones. Many, when we say many, we mean one, but well, many ones. So when we invoke the word many, we're also including the, the concept of one. One is involved in the idea of many. Many just means many ones. So one and many ones, what's the difference? They're all ones. If all ones are there, then what is the difference between them? What is the difference between one and one? So many ones is the same as one. And logic, they know that many ones and one. How you, if you can't distinguish the many ones, then they're all one. How do you talk about many? So many is an idea we add to one, but it doesn't have much re much relationship to the idea of one. It's an additional idea we just add it. And this is the way we think when we distinguish one and many as as one. Uh, as plural form of the singular. Many means the plural form and the singular form. So they're not unrelated to one another. They're related very intimately. The singular and plural. So uh, Hegel said, the I that is we and the we that is I. We make this distinction and difference and identity ourselves. When you when you say we are going to the store or we are going to the shore or we are going to go to the temple or we are going to sing kirtan. We include yourself. But you identify with that at the same time. It's we means all the others, but you are also there. You don't say we and mean that not, not including me. <laughs> we includes you and everyone else together working as one. Just like in the United States, they have a constitution of the United States. And it begins with we, the people of the United States. That includes everyone. Yet it's acting like one people, like one idea, one thing. <clears throat> we all say yes. We all agree. We, the people. If the people means so many things, but it's talking like one person. So I and we. I is the singular, we is the, the plural form of the first person. Uh, first person, singular, first person, plural in English. I and we. Every language has that. All refer to the first person. How is that? Singular and plural both refer to the same thing. So one and many <laughs> is like that. They all refer to the same one. <clears throat> one is found in the many and it's found in the one. So they're not two different ideas. Just one in the singular form, one in the plural form. That's all. how we want to talk about it. When you say tree, tree, you are talking about that tree out in the backyard. It may be talking, 
of the tree out in the backyard. But that word tree can refer to any tree, all trees. And you say, this is a tree, repeating the one in your backyard. Then you turn around and you say, this is a tree, the one in your front yard. <laughs> then which is the tree? The both. So a tree can be either singular or plural. Universal or particular, they call that. Everything has that kind of structure, universal and particular. Your plate in front of you when you're eating can be many plates, refers to many plates. Plate refers to all plates. Elephant, elephant can refer to a single elephant or to all elephants. Well, here's the same word. This is an elephant. This is a, well, wait a minute. This is an elephant. How can that be an elephant? <laughs> you don't say it's something different. It's different, but it's not different. So one and different. Huh? That's the relation of the universal in particular. Krishna's mystical energy, his mystical power. Krishna can differentiate himself and infinitely into so many different forms. And yet he's the same Krishna. Not even human forms only. Animal, insect, mineral. All emanates from Krishna. Uh, yet all have their source, their rest in Krishna. Behold my mystic powers, Krishna says. Behold my mystic powers. Don't think we can grab everything within our fist. <laughs> we were in his, we are in his enthrall. We are enthralled with him. I think we will stop. My affectionate wishes for your good health and everything goes nicely, smoothly for you. When will you leave? No, for India. We are trying Maharaj, 5 of October. 5 October. Okay. Well, good. Good luck at doing all that. Will we see you before you leave? I think so, huh? Yes, I hope so. Okay. All right. My very <laughs> humble dhanavats to all you Vaishnavas, good souls. Please take care. Be well. Dhanavats. 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 Dhanavats.